Hi, this is Dr. Jennifer Klamek Yingling, and today we're going to talk about some respiratory topics. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, lung cancer. So um, take a look at this slide. On the upper top, as you can see, in 2021, the estimated new uh, cases of cancer, you can see that lung cancer is number two for both men and women. Men, number one cause is prostate, second is lung. Female, um, number one cause of new cancers is breast and number two is lung cancer. So this is why it's so important that we do screening on our patients and talk about smoking cessation. When you look at the um, estimated deaths due to uh, cancer, what you can see if for both men and women, again, lung cancer is the number one cause. Um, so we know that the leading cause of death overall is cardiovascular disease. Um, and it is important to pay attention to the screening guidelines. So the, so the USPSTF revised the recommended ages and pack years for lung cancer screening. They expanded the uh, age range to 50 to 80 years and reduced the pack year history to 20 pack years of smoking. Um, so that's a little bit of a change from the previous guidelines, so please note that. Um, how do we do this? You want to assess the risk on age and pack your smoking. So is um, you're going to find out, you know, ask, is your patient between the ages of 50 and 80 years and they, have they accumulated a 20 pack year or more of smoking? So a pack year, let's talk a little bit about that. That's the way of how we calculate how much a person has smoked in their lifetime. So one pack year is equivalent to smoking an average of 20 cigarettes or one pack per day for a year. Um, how are we going to screen? So if the person falls within the age range of 50 and 80 and has a 20 pack year or more smoking history, you're going to you know, talk with your patient and make a shared decision about screening. Um, you know, you want to talk about the benefits, the limitations, any um, negative or harms um, that may occur as well. So if the patient decides to get screened, um, how you're going to screen that for lung cancer is a low dose CAT scan. And, um, you know, again, if the person is currently smoking, you want to talk about smoking cessation. Um, you're going to screen every year with a low dose C CAT scan of the, the lungs. And um, you can stop this screening once the person hasn't smoked for 15 years or has um, some health condition that limits life expectancy or the ability to have lung surgery. So at every visit for your smokers, you're going to want to discuss smoking cessation. And there's the five A's. It's ask. And you want to identify and document tobacco use for every patient at every visit. Advise. You want to have a strong, clear, personalized manner that you approach the patient about quitting um, tobacco use. You want to assess, is um, your patient willing to make a quit or attempt to change at this time? You're going to want to assist. Um, so for the patient who wants to quit, you may use counseling. They may use pharmacotherapy uh, to help them quit. What drugs do we use for smoking cessation? You can use your Chantix, Wellbutrin. You may use um, nicotine gum or a patch. Um, and then you're going to arrange. So with these patients, follow-up is really important. You're going to want to schedule a follow-up um, to contact and check in with the patient. It may be in person or by phone. And usually that um, is scheduled around the, the first week after the quit date. But once again, smoking cessation, every patient, every visit. Let's talk a little bit about community-acquired pneumonia. What are some of the signs of bacterial pneumonia? Usually a fever uh, greater than 38 degrees Celsius. Um, it also may be hypothermia less than 35 degrees Celsius. Patients often will have tachypnea, and that's um, with respirations greater than 18. When you do your assessment, you may see that the patient's using accessory uh, respiratory muscles Oftentimes, you'll see the patient will have tachycardia, heart rate greater than 100, or bradycardia less than 60. You may see central cyanosis um, with their elders and 
uh, you may see altered mental status, and what are some of the physical findings that you're going to see upon exam. So you may see, or excuse me, hear adventitious breath sounds, rails, crackles, bronchi, or wheezes. You may hear a decreased intensity of breath sounds. Egophony may be present. Whispered periloquy. Okay. When you percuss, there may be dullness. Okay. Dullness often will indicate that there is a, a fusion. Um, you, if it is a large effusion, you may see tracheal deviation, lymphadenopathy, and you may hear a pleural friction uh, rub. What are some of the signs and symptoms that your patients may come in and, and complain of? They may uh, come in with a cough. Um, often a cough will have sputum. And it's important to kind of put together the pieces. Um, you know, you may get a clue to drive your differential on investigating what color the sputum is. Now, often I'll ask the patient, well, okay, what color is the sputum that comes up? And they're like, I don't know. I spit it out. I didn't look at it. I swallowed it. But if they present with, and they tell you they have rust colored sputum, um, this may indicate that the patient has um, strep pneumonia. Okay. In the individual that complains of green sputum, this may be pseudomonas, this may be H flu, um, and a pneumococcal type of infection. If your patient tells you they have red currant jelly sputum, and this is like bright red, Christmas tree red, um, you want to think maybe about Klebsiella. And um, individuals that tell them, tell you that they have like a small, foul smelling or bad tasting sputum, that may be an anaerobic infection. Now, sometimes your patients will tell you um, you know, I have this terrible salty sputum in my mouth, or they may say it's really sweet tasting. They may give you an indication of where the sputum and the mucus is coming from. So salty sputum often is from the sinus, postnasal drip, whereas if your patient tells you that they have a sweet tasting um, sputum, you want to think that that uh, mucus is coming up from the lungs. Um, a couple other things that you may find in the exam that may give you a clue. Um, oftentimes, not always, but sometimes patients with Legionella will have bradycardia. Um, your patient that has a history of periodontal disease, they may be um, dealing with an anaerobic um, bacteria or polymicrobial bacteria. Um, you know, and if your patient has a decreased gag reflex when you're examining them, um, you want to think about an aspiration pneumonia. It makes sense if, you know, they're not able to swallow well or protect that airway that they may be at risk for aspiration. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the things you may find when you're doing the lung examination. So when you percuss, um, I want you to think about some of um, your findings. So if you hear timpani, you need to think it's a, like a drum, right? Large cavity. What causes a large cavity? That can be a TB. It can be abscess, an abscess. It can be the gastric bubble, okay? Hyperresonance. Um, if you hear hyperresonance, uh, often this is uh, COPD, okay? It can be a pneumothorax. Uh, you will hear uh, or see percussion documented as um, resonant lung sounds, resonance. Okay, that's a normal lung finding. And if your patient has dullness or flatness as you percuss, you need to think about your effusion or your pneumonia. A couple other things you might want to think about. If your patient has consolidation, you may hear crackles. If they have a pleural effusion, you may hear a rub. If um, you have a pneumothorax, you may hear an occasional click. Okay, so those are just some of the things you may want to think about when you are doing your exam. So CURB-65, this is used um, to screen patients to determine whether or not um, they need to be admitted to the hospital. You know, and you may be saying, well, I'm going to be an FNP. I don't need to know that. Well, you do because your patients often in this age population will come to the primary care office first because they often will have large co-pays for ERs and urgent cares. So when you're doing your assessment, there's some things to think about. Curb 65, um, this you need to know for practice. You need to know for the boards. What does each one of the, word, the letters mean? So C, is your patient confused? 
you, urea, is the BUN greater than 19? Do they have some type of altered uh, kidney function? R, respiratory rate greater than 30? Blood pressure, is the blood pressure systolically equal to or less than 90? Or is the diastolic blood pressure equal to or less than 60? Um, is their age equal to or greater than 65? So when you go down um, and you look at how you score that, um, each one is a point. So zero to one, this patient is probably suitable for home treatment. There's a low risk of death. Um, if they score a two, you may want to consider um, a hospital admission. Greater than or equal to three, this is a patient that is presenting with severe symptoms of pneumonia and they have a high risk of death. So these are patients that you do not want to um, treat in an outpatient basis. Um, you know, often your patient is going to have tachycardia too, so keep that in mind. We know if they have a fever, um, it'll elevate the heart rate, but we also know with a low blood pressure and a high um, pulse, that could be an early sign of sepsis, so you need to keep an eye on that as well. Let's talk about the outpatient treatment of uh, pneumonia. There were some guidelines that were updated in 2019 on the ISDA, and um, Keep in mind that the most common bacterial causes of community-acquired pneumonia are strep pneumonia, H. flu, mycoplasma, um, staph aureus, and legionella, chlamydia, and Moraxella catarrhalis. Keep in mind that no matter what drug that you decide to use, you need to treat community-acquired pneumonia for a minimum of five days. So you're going to look at some of the things that are going on with your patients. You know, is the patient um, previously healthy with no risk factors for drug resistant estimone infection? And, or, is there no use of antimicrobials within the previous three months? This is important because that's a risk for um, resistant to the, resistance to the antibiotics that you choose. If the patient meets this criteria, you're going to, you can treat with amoxicillin, that's one gram, TID for five to seven days, or doxycycline, or you can use a uh, macrolide if they're allergic to penicillin. So if your patient, on the other hand, has comorbid conditions, diabetes, chronic heart disease, um, chronic lung, liver, renal disease, elderly patients, your smokers, patients who are alcoholics, have malignancies or a history of asplenia, um, or they have an immunosuppressive condition or on drugs that may cause this. You think about your patients who are um, your rheumatoid arthritis patients. Uh, so, and or if there's been use of antimicrobials in the past three months, or there's any other risk factors for that um, drug-resistant S. pneumonia um, infection. So if that is the case, you're going to treat your patient. You can use monotherapy, use a fluoroquinolone, okay, or you can use combination therapy. And if that's the case, you are going to treat with a beta-lactam or cephalosporin with a macrolide or doxycycline, okay. You, um, for patients with outpatient pneumonia, you, it's not recommended that you use corticosteroids. Um, you do want to get a sputum culture and blood culture with severe disease and um, with all patients treated for MRSA or Pseudomonas. Um, keep in mind, um, you know, the alternative to macrolide um, can be that doxycycline. So the geographic um, location of an abnormality on the chest x-ray may give you a clue to what is going on. Oftentimes tuberculosis is found in the upper lobes, whereas the pneumonia is seen in the right middle lobe and the bilateral lower lobes. Keep in mind if you are not able to see the right cardiac border clearly, that's a, a little spot that um, you know, that's common, especially in our younger patients, um, the right middle lobe um, pneumonia can hide. So make sure um, you're taking a good look at the uh, chest x-ray um, and kind of thinking about like, where is it in the lungs? Is it upper lobes, lower lobes? Because that's going to help drive your differential. 
So take a look at this uh, slide. And when you look at this, do you are you able to see the right cardiac border? What do you think is going on? This is a, a pneumonia that's seen in the middle and the lower lobe. Okay. In a patient with pneumonia, what do you expect to see? You're going to have increased tactile firmness. They may, um, that's when you do 99, 99, you'd have more vibration um, because this is going to show, you know, kind of lead you to believe that there's consolidation or some pus rattling around um, causing the sound and vibration. So let's take a look at this slide, this chest x ray. What do you see? What type of abnormality? Do you think what's going on with this patient? Well, you can see that there's an abnormality in the left upper lobe, and this would be suspect for tuberculosis. Okay, what, how do we um, diagnose or screen for tuberculosis? We use the MAN2 um, tuberculin skin test. You can use the quantiferon. Um, the, to confirm diagnosis, the gold standard is uh, culture and sputum, and you're going to see maybe findings on a chest x-ray like you see on this slide. So let's talk a little bit about how you would interpret a tuberculous uh, uh, skin test. Okay, so greater than 15, it's positive in any individual. Greater than uh, 10 millimeters, would be considered positive in patients who are recent immigrate, immigrants from high prevalence countries, um, residents and employees of high risk conjugate settings. Okay, think about people who work in prisons, hospitals, nursing homes, um, people that work in the laboratory, um, individuals who are at clinical, are at clinical risk for tuberculosis, um, children less than four, and um, infants, children, and adolescents exposed to adults in high-risk categories. Now, an individual would be considered positive if their skin test reads greater than five millimeters. And I want you to just think a little bit about that. Um, that's somebody who is immunocompromised, maybe your RA patients, um, someone who has HIV. Okay, so immunosuppressant. I want you to look at, in the middle of the slide, it says HIV, HIV, okay? So V can also be the Roman numeral for five, right? So if you remember high five, HIV, greater than five, that should be a, a, a cue for you to remember that immunocompromisation, the tuberculin skin test greater than five millimeters is positive. So let's talk a little bit about pertussis. Okay, who's at risk? Pregnant women, our infants, uh, close contacts with someone who has pertussis, um, someone who has waning immunity, our elderly. Um, this is also called the 100-day cough. We treat with ma uh, macrolide. Uh, keep in mind, Pregnant women, we are going to update their immunization um, with the, the um, Tdap, usually um, weeks 27 to 36. You want to try if you can um, earlier in that window, but it is uh, acceptable to do the immunization uh, 36 or 27 to 36 weeks. Um, it's important that we in encourage our pregnant women to have the um, pertussis vaccine as well as the um, the Tdap as well as the influenza. Why might that be? So we know that um, there may be some immunity that the baby um, does get from the mother's immunity that will help protect them until they can get their first shots. And we know with infants they can't get their first flu shot until six months. Um, so it's important that we do keep, pay attention to that. Now, the other thing is to look at the different types. You're like, oh my gosh, there's DTAP, there's TDAP, right? So if you look at the letters, um, look at the right side of the screen, you'll see DTAP. This is for young children, okay? Um, 
and then, then next to it you see the Tdap right down the line the rest of the lifespan. So if you are confused, just try to remember, okay, D comes before the letter T. Um, the other thing, another way to remember it is to think about uh, Tdap is for tall people. So people um, 11 throughout the lifespan. Okay, so just keep those in mind. They are different. Um, DTAP is for our infants and young children, and our TDAP is 11 through the rest of the lifespan. Let's talk a little bit about our respiratory meds and the suffixes that come after, because this is important for you to know. Um, so if your patient comes in and tells you I'm on albuterol, you can recognize what medication they're on, or if they're on um, a different medication, you will be able to um, recognize what the respiratory meds are. So they're short-acting beta agonists. They call this also Saba, okay? And uh, the suffix is Tural, okay? There's only one, Albuterol, all right? Um, there's also long-acting beta agonists, and these are Labas. They also end in Tural, okay? Inhaled corticosteroids, we use this for prevention to decrease inflammation. You may see the suffix of Eid or own. Long-acting muscarinic, uh, muscarinic uh, antagonists, these are your llamas, okay? This helps with secretions, with mucus, okay? Um, they're anticholinergic, and you'll see them, the suffix is uh, PM. About your albuterol. Okay, so albuterol, it comes in, the canister has 200 puffs. Um, the canisters are usually good for one year. Um, and usually we will order albuterol two puffs as needed every six hours. Okay, so if your patient is taking two puffs every six hours, so it'd be four times a day for 30 days, that would be so two times four times 30. They'd be approximately 240 puffs. So they would need a, a canister. Why I'm mentioning this is you may have patients come in, whether you're working, you know, telemedicine, ER, urgent care, primary care, it can kind of give you an idea how often your patient is using it. So if they're supposed to be using the albuterol two puffs every six hours as needed, and after 30 days or before 30 days, they're calling up and saying, I'm out of my medication, that may give you a, a clue that they are not in good control because we know albuterol is one of their controller meds for um, asthma. Um, so just keep that in mind. Why is this important? Um, they do, studies have shown that frequent um, or regular use of the, the SABA, the albuterol is associated with adverse um, effects. They, um, think that you know it, it's thought that these patients can have rebound um, hyper responsiveness they can have a decreased bronchilator response um, they can have increased incidophilic airway inflammation um, and we do know that and are concerned that the higher use of SAWA is associated with adverse clinical outcomes so if you're dispensing greater than or equal to three canisters per year um, you know that can tell you that your patient is probably going to end up in the emergency room. Um, you know, they're at higher risk for exacerbations. And dispensing greater than 12 canisters per year is associated with a higher risk of death. Okay. So they did kind of back it up. We used to, you know, be able to, you know, in an acute phase, order it every four hours, but they now are recommending, you know, two puffs every six hours um, for that controller. So just keep that in mind if your patient presents, you'll, this will kind of give you some idea of how um, often they're using it. And every canister's got 200 puffs, so just keep that in mind. So you're probably wondering why on earth, in the middle of a respiratory presentation, there is a slide with clam bake in aluminum. I just want you to think about that for a couple minutes. Clam bake in aluminum, and hopefully you burn that into your brain. So thinking about that mnemonic, clam bake in aluminum. If you are curious how to increase or decrease your asthma and COPD meds, those respiratory meds we talked about in the previous slide, this mnemonic will come in handy. So if you look at the slide in front of you, um, you know, you're going to see 
COPD, Lama, Laba, ICS, and asthma. Okay. If, if moving towards the right with COPD, you're going to use your Lama first, then your Laba, then your inhaled corticosteroid. Okay. If you are treating asthma, you are going to use your inhaled corticosteroid, your long acting beta agonist, your LABA, and then your LAMA. Okay. So your LAMAs, again, just to recap, those are the, the medications that the suffix is tropium. Your LABA this is going to end with teral. And your inhaled corticosteroids are um, medications that have the suffix of own or eyed. So remember, clam bacon in, in aluminum. So we use a stepwise approach with both conditions. So if you increase sim if you have increased symptoms, you're going to add. If you have decreased symptoms, you are going to attempt to drop a med because we always want to treat our patients with the lowest um, dose and frequency of or strength that we can. Okay, so keep that in mind. I encourage you to take a picture of this when you are doing your review questions, um, you're doing your case studies, even in practice. Um, you know, it's an easy way to remember. Clam bake and aluminum. It's kind of like a weird mnemonic. I thought about it long and hard, but, um, you know, I baited this on some of my uh, graduate students, and I, I know I had some feedback from one that it really helped them remember that you're going to go up with your meds and how to go down and vice versa. Clam bake in aluminum. So take a look at this chest x-ray. What do you think is going on with this patient? When you look at this patient, if you look at the diaphragm, you're going to see that it's very, very, very flat at the bottom. The, the lungs almost look like tombstones, um, the Ten Commandments. Um, this is a, a common, common finding with a patient with COPD. What is the cardinal sign of COPD? Dyspnea. These patients have chronic cough, chronic sputum. They may have a history of exposure. Um, they may have a history of smoking. And once again, if the, every visit, every patient, you want to talk about the smoking cessation um, and you want to assess these patients uh, pack per year because you may need to do screening for lung cancer. Um, with COPD, you're going to add meds. The last med that you add will be oxygen. Uh, once the patient becomes oxygen dependent, the mortality obviously goes up significantly. In patients with COPD, you may need to avoid beta blockers because of the fact that um, if they are in poor control, the beta blocker and the beta um, two agonists will kind of fight against each other, the neurotransmitter. Um, what are some other meds that you're going to use? You're going to use your beta agonists. You're going to use your long-acting um, medications. You may use the anticholinergics, your Atrovet, Spiriva. Um, these patients, you may even use some theophylline and make sure um, if they're on theophylline, you do know that there's a lot of interactions because of the cytochrome P450 system. So this, that's a big safety um, consideration in your patients who are on um, theophylline. Um, patients with COPD on the exam, you're going to have hyper resonance. Okay. Resonance is normal normal lungs, hyperresonance is um, associated with COPD and emphysema. Um, these patients might be on steroids too because you want to reduce that inflammation as well. So just keep that in mind about COPD. So what is a patient with COPD? What are they going to look like? Um, we know that the COPD is irreversible. Um, 25% of our patients with COPD have never smoked. Uh, you may see barrel chesting. And on the left side of the slide, you'll see what the barrel chest looks like. They have a hyperinflation. They may have nail clubbing. And to do this, uh, even on yourself, take your two index fingers and put them up nail bed to nail bed, and you should see like a little kite or diamond shape, okay? A person that has nail clubbing will not have a diamond shape um, when they put their two fingernails together. Okay, that's how you look for clubbing. 
Um, we know that emphysema is a form of COPD. It's um, progressive lung disease with infl overinflation of the alveoli. And once again, your hyperresonance, okay? You're going to have hyperresonance with percussion. For COPD, we will look at um, the gold guidelines to, to kind of guide how we treat our patients. And um, how we classify COPD is airflow limitation severity. And that, that's with a post bronchilator FEV, FEV1, okay? Um, this, we get, how do we do, get this, you know, um, number? This is what we get when we do PFTs, okay? We know PFTs are influenced by height, age, and gender. Um, you can think about HAG, that's a mnemonic, height, age, and gender. They influence your PFTs. And if your patient has an FEV1 less than 70%, that is COPD. So let's uh, see if clam bacon aluminum works. Okay, if you look at the COPD gold guidelines, what is the first drug that you see on that left hand side? You got your llama, right? And or your lava. And what is your third line? Inhaled, inhaled corticosteroid. Okay, so your first line is your anticholinergic with your saba. Okay, second line is your lava. Um, your third line is your inhaled corticosteroid. And for the fourth line, um, if you're not having good control with the, all of these things in conjunction, you're going to want to refer. Um, remember your llamas, this is your long acting muscarinic mucus, muscarinic mucus. Um, we talked about a FAV1. 70 or less, um, especially with the history of smoking, is usually the gold standard on how we diagnose COPD. And, um, you know, our llamas, um, often we're going to be giving those because this is going to um, dry up that um, mucus and hopefully allow them to breathe a little bit better. So, clam bacon in aluminum with COPD, we're going to do llama, lava. ICS. So let's talk a little bit about asthma. Um, asthma, this is a really common chronic um, respiratory disorder. You're going to see it frequently in practice. It affects individuals across the lifespan. We have a lot of children that are affected with um, asthma. And um, how do these patients present? They may have wheezing. Um, young children may not wheeze. They may cough. They may um, have shortness of breath or chest tightness or pain. Um, so one thing we do know about asthma, asthma generally is reversible, okay? And we want to control our asthma because um, with increased inflammation, we know that they can have long-term effects. Um, and sometimes these patients will move into COPD um, as they get older. So it's really important that we keep on our patients and um, we use the, the GINA evidence-based strategy to, um, as we, to guide our clinical practice. Um, with asthma, we assess, adjust, and re review response. That's the pattern we use. You want to start your initial treatment at the step the patient is currently at according to symptoms, and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, and keep in mind, there were some guideline changes in 2020, and they no longer recommend treating asthma in adults and adolescents with SABA alone, okay? They want a, you to add the inhaled corticosteroids and that's symptom-driven or daily. So keep that in mind. Your inhaled corticosteroid um, is now considered a controller, just like a, a SABA, because we know with the SABA, there, there are some problems with those drugs that we're learning about as um, you know we, we've used them for several years. There's more evidence now. Um, what do you want to do with your patients with asthma? You want to think about your exacerbation triggers. You know, viruses, URIs, um, pollens, pollution, poor adherence all can um, trigger 
and exacerbation. And um, we talked earlier about the regular or frequent uh, Saba has adverse effects and adverse outcomes. Doesn't mean we're not going to use them because this is a very common controller, but we're just thinking about it a little bit different. And if you can introduce the inhaled corticosteroid as a controller, um, that also may be helpful for your patients. So when we think about asthma um, and how we classify and what step we start medications um, at, we're going to think about um, how often symptoms are occurring. So in mild asthma, you've got step one and two. These are symptoms. Uh, step one is symptoms less than twice a month. Um, patients well controlled. Step two, symptoms are two times a month, but less than daily. So step one and two symptoms, um, you remember the, the number two, okay? Moderate asthma, okay, this is step three. These um, patients will have symptom most days or will be waking with asthma more than once a week, okay? Severe asthma, um, that's a step four or five. These are patients that are having symptoms all day, all night, okay? They're waking with asthma um, once or, or more a week, and they're also going to have low lung volume. And your step fives, these, these patients need to be seen by the pulmonologist. Um, you're going to need to know how to classify your patients with um, asthma, and that's mild, moderate, or severe, okay? Let's look at the stepwise approach to asthma, and we can apply our clam bake and aluminum. And if you look at the slide, you're going to see with um, we're going to go backwards in that mnemonic. With asthma, we do the uncoiled corticosteroids, okay, and then we're going to move over to your lava, okay, and then later in treatment, you would go use a um, llama. Um, you want to Keep in mind um, that the low-dose inhaled corticosteroids provides the most clinical benefit for most patients with asthma. Um, we often will use the um, singular, or, and um, keep in mind in 2020, there was a box warning about um, serious neuropsychotic or neuropsychiatric events, um, suicides in adults and children, nightmares, some behavioral problems. Um, they advise restricting the use to allergic rhinitis. Um, keep in mind your llamas are not rescue inhalers, okay? They are not rescue inhalers. Um, that's something really that you want to keep in mind. And, you know, if your patient is presenting with more symptoms, you're going to move up in the um, stepwise approach. Now, once you move them up, you're going to once again assess you may adjust and you may go backwards because, again, you want to have your patient on the least amount of medications with the best control. So we talked a little bit about asthma. You are going to start with the inhaled corticosteroids, move on to a llama, and then perhaps a llama. Um, think about that mnemonic, clam bake in aluminum. One way to remember intermittent asthma is 2T, less than twice a week, less than twice a month, okay? Um, make sure that you are doing peak flows. This is how um, you are going to assess what control your patient is in, not their controller use, okay? Um, every patient should get a short-acting beta agonist or an inhaled corticosteroid, okay, for controlling. Remember um, what we talked about with the PFTs, um, PFT HAG, height, age, and gender affect those results. And, um, you know, you want to limit your, um, and pay attention to that SABA use because we do know that um, there can be some adverse effects with increased use. So as we finish up this uh, quick little lecture, I just want to recap a couple things. Um, and bring to your attention and kind of tie it up with a nice bow. So we didn't talk about it, but bronchitis, um, these patients, they will not have sputum production. They'll be afebrile, okay? Often it's viral in etiology. Pneumonia often will present with fever, 
Okay, asthma, first line um, treatment at a minimum is your Saba and or a inhaled corticosteroid for your controller. Okay, um, walking pneumonia. All right, this is a patient that's usually young. They come in with coughing. They may have a little bit of sore throat um, and they'll have fever. Um, you want to consider an atypical pneumonia. They also call it walking pneumonia. These patients are treated with a macrolide such as azithromycin. Remember the mnemonic, clam bake and aluminum. That'll help guide you on which way to go as you, in a stepwise fashion with your meds for um, COPD and asthma. And I guess that's about it for respiratory. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it helps you in your practice and on your boards. And um, hopefully we'll talk soon.